Hello, everyone. Welcome to the third of our NYO Abu Dhabi roundtables that we're having with leaders of a wide variety of industries in the UAE and well beyond. So far this fall, we have heard from Mohammed Alabar of Amar on real estate development and his vision for cities and for Dubai in particular. And we spoke with Rola Abumane, the CEO of Standard Chartered UAE on the financial industries. So today we're going to be talking about media, entertainment and creative industries. And we are truly blessed and fortunate to have with us today um, some of the most visionary leaders in the country in this sector who can inform us on all of these topics. And all three of them are in major roles at Image Nation 2454, which is Abu Dhabi's comprehensive media and entertainment company and media free zone. What I'll do is introduce the three of them and then get our conversation going. And since many of you have tuned in for these conversations already, you know the drill. As always, you are very welcome to begin to put in questions whenever you want. Uh, students are most welcome to do so uh, and to do so in the Q&A function in Zoom. We all have learned how to do that. And we will track them and answer them, but we will also leave a good bit of time at the end to get to as many of your questions and observations as possible. So here are our uh, panelists and uh, they will, I hope, uh, sh uh, show themselves as I introduce them. First, Michael Guerin. Uh, Michael Guerin, uh, hi Michael, is a highly respected executive in the media industry internationally with more than 50 years of experience. That number really had to sink in for me, Michael, I have to say. He uh, is the CEO of 2454 Abu Dhabi, and he took on that responsibility in January of this year. Uh, and he leads the 2454, the Image Nation 2454 team in uh, a range of areas, but especially in building and developing a vibrant ecosystem of local and global partners with the goal of enabling and inspiring the most creative and innovative content to come to you. Today, more than 500 media companies from around the world, including CNN, Sky News, Arabia, and Ubisoft, called 2454 home. Michael joined 2454 from Image Nation, and as you hear, they are now one title, uh, where he served as CEO from February 2011. He has also worked with Abu Dhabi Media Company, Time, Fortune, and Time Life Television, among other global brands. Also with us is Alma Al Mubarak. Welcome, Alma. Uh, Alma, there she is. Alma leads the marketing and communications team for Image Nation. She has also managed and launched the new brand and original programs for Quest Arabia, a pan Arab television network. And this intrigues me a lot. Uh, since we talk a lot about diplomacy at MW Abu Dhabi, she built the public diplomacy department at Image Nation Abu Dhabi and also managed the launch of the history of the Emirates campaign at the regional and international level. Her work includes partnering with the Ministry of Foreign Affairs to launch the Art of Cultural Diplomacy webinar series, uh, which I certainly have been attending through this pandemic. And she also partners with the Department of Culture and Tourism um, on the, to launch uh, the History at Home project, she may say more about. And third with us is uh, Hans Freken. Hans is the head of the Abu Dhabi Film Commission. Welcome to you. And he arrived there just this year, uh, as I always like to say, just in time for the pandemic. And that's true for many of us, I'm afraid. He is the founding commissioner um, of the of the Quebec Film and TV Council. And the Quebec Film and TV Council in Canada under his leadership generated a billion and a half dollars in investment for Quebec, staging shoots for feature films like 300 and uh, X-Men Apocalypse, as well as one of my personal favorites, uh, Smurfs. He is a world leader in, an, in animation 
And at the Quebec Council, he spearheaded the creation of the visual effects cluster, the dubbing hub, and the digital media lab. And to be able to do this, all of this, Hans created partnerships with all six major Hollywood studios, the likes of Warner Brothers, Disney, Universal, Sony, and so forth. Early in his career, he was involved in distributing and marketing dozens of films, including the blockbusters Titanic and Braveheart. Welcome to all of you, and thank you so much for being with us. Let us get our conversation uh, going, and please, uh, I hope you've unmuted your mics, and if there's a little feedback, we can always deal with it, but it seems to be, the sound seems to be good so far. Let me uh, start with each of you to find out a little bit more about you and how you got to the places where you are now. So Michael, I have briefly, of course, mentioned the milestones in your 50 year career. So I've barely skimmed the surface. And I want to ask you more about that trajectory. How did you come to lead a major media enterprise in Abu Dhabi? When you were a recent graduate of Harvard all those years ago, this surely wasn't what you had been thinking of as your long-term uh, destiny. Okay, well, uh, actually, um, this probably will be my longest and most important uh, comment in this uh, round table, because in fact, um, it actually led directly to what I'm doing today um, for two reasons. The first, I believe I share with uh, all the undergraduates at uh, NYU Adani which is, I, uh, at the time I entered Harvard, which was, uh, believe it or not, back in 1964, um, I was a distinct minority having graduated from a public high school. And we made up, uh, public high school students made up about only 25% of the student body. The other three quarters coming from the elite uh, prep schools like Andover, Exeter, Choate, Groton, we used to call them St. Middlesex and <laughs> St. Grattlesex. And um, I entered with a very distinct feeling that uh, I had a, a place in the world beyond which I could not progress. And probably uh, more important than any education uh, I, I received at Harvard, um, I, I left with a life lesson that um, the, the restrictions um, uh, that I faced were those that I placed on myself, that there was no ceiling, there was the, the limitations were those that I imposed, that anything was possible. And I was lucky enough to start, as you mentioned, at a, a time where I worked for 10 years in a variety of capacities. And I got to see a lot of unhappy people who uh, from the outside looked like they were having very successful careers, but uh, became alcoholics, divorces, uh, they were not happy folks. And those two were probably the most important early lessons that I learned because uh, we all know people that from the outside look like they're very successful and they're um, not very happy. And um, to my mind, while the outside world may look at them as successes, I look at them as life failures. And so at a very early age, I decided that my goal was to be happy in my life. Not happy in my career. Probably five or six very distinctive stages to my career. And every stage was triggered by my leaving from something, not going to something because I wasn't happy anymore doing what I was doing. And so I left. And then when you left, you had the opportunity to figure out what's next. And you had a chance to assess your life, not just your career. And um, one thing led to another and ultimately I'm at the happiest place in my life in 74 years. and. Um, I think that's 
why I said this is probably the longest and most important thing I'll have to say, because what I wish for everybody uh, at NYU and everyone I know is, is a happy life, not a successful career. That's an incredibly important and powerful statement. I hope that many students will have heard this, those who are on now. And of course, this is being recorded, as you all know, so you'll be able to hear it later. I, I will thank you for, for doing that and, and beginning uh, in that frame. Um, so, Han, and I forgot to mention something extremely important about Michael first, which is that he is the child of an NYU graduate, his mother. Yeah, uh, I, well, more than I forgot that, to mention that. To say yeah. that. My association with NYU began in May of 1946 when I attended my mother's graduation in her womb, having been born uh, eight weeks uh, later. I absolutely always have loved that story. And it's also so telling, but think about the year when she graduated from NYU right after World War II, a at woman, a, a mother at the age of 40. It is, it is, it, it exemplifies not only something about her. Yeah, she graduated at the age of 20. Well, that's she really- She was 20 it. years old when she graduated it, and when I was yeah. born. That's an amazing story and of resilience on her part and, and grit and understanding the importance of education. And it's also such an NYU story because NYU created in 1831 is an engine of human development and opportunity. It was created as a non-sectarian, non-denominational institution for uh, kids from New York and, and, and older people in New York to be able to, to retool their careers or get an education whenever they'd be ready for it. So it's a, it's a really beautiful story. Now, Hans, you don't have to do the same thing, but we've already seen your cat, which is very wonderful. I hope people could see the cats coming around. Uh, cats very welcome. But Hans, I could, of course, ask you a very similar question. And maybe you can tell us a little bit about how you see your path that led to your becoming uh, the head of the Film Commission for Abu Dhabi? Um, my Lord. Well, um, firstly, I want to say that I'm going to, uh, I'm going to look at the recording and replay Michael's statement because it really is a, uh, a lifelong philosophy that I think for everyone's impor important to everyone. Um, my current trajectory, it was, it was kind of, um, um, a series of decisions and circumstances to led me to where I like so like so many people like so many people but you know I I often think you know when you get to a certain age you often think well had you decided B instead of A where would you be today so you know when I was 20 years old I was in the Canadian military pentathlon team which is you know so uh, we had you know it's uh, we had competitions all around the world and actually won in Eindhoven in your country, Marriott. And, um, and af at, the end of the, uh, at the end of that year, as a professional pentathlete, I was asked to be recruited in the Air Force. But instead, I decided to follow my heart and do what I loved, which was skiing. And I became a professional skier. And I lived in the Alps for five years. So who knows where I'd be today if I decided to choose path B, you know, fighter pilot, maybe I wouldn't even be here, who knows. Um, so anyway, so after a five year ski career, um, I, you know, while I was living in the Alps, I opened a ski shop, I, ha I had a real estate business and I quickly realized that I had a knack for business. And so I figured, you know, it was time to get serious now that the knees weren't working so well. And I went to university. So I was a late student. I went to university at 26, the University of Ottawa, which, and the reason I chose Ottawa was because at the time it was the only official bilingual um, university in Canada. And I was bilingual. So I thought it would, you know, be a feather in my cap. So I did that. Um, graduated uh, from, uh, from business with, uh, with majors in finance and marketing but still didn't really know what I wanted to do. And this is, this really comes back to, to what Michael said is, 
because I was a mature student, perhaps I had enough life experience to know one thing is that I didn't want to do what I didn't like, you know? So, uh, and despite, despite all that wisdom as a 29 year old, my first job of course was in finance. And after I quickly realized I did not like it. And so I left finance and I, I, uh, I went to my first, and I had my first overseas job in Japan. And then in Japan, is, uh, is when I, I met uh, somebody at Warner Brothers who became a friend and he said, you should, you should be a film distributor. And I said, great, what's that? <laughs> no idea. Anyway, so through a series of meetings and flights to Los Angeles, to the studios and uh, the studio in Century City, I was hired by 20th Century Fox. And, uh, and what really happened, and there was a thousand, and the, the sorry about it. she she just loves webinars i don't know what it is about her <laughs> um and uh yeah and there was you know and so anyway i was hired and i started my career uh as a distribution executive for 20th century fox first in uh los angeles then in south korea then in uh indonesia and then in Fr paris for france it's extraordinary international career. Are you still there, Michael? Yeah. Yes, okay. Are, um, uh, Hans, I mean, I, I, Hans, were you finished with your comment? I was just wondering. Well, I, I kind of, so the last thing I heard was Indonesia. <laughs> yeah. Oh, did I, did I freeze out? Did I block out? Maybe for a second, at least ah. in my feed you did. Yeah. Okay. But anyway, so, th so that's basically it. So I've been, you know, and then after 20th Century Fox, I, I was uh, asked by Telefilm Canada, which is uh, the um, Canadian film funding agency who's also, also administers uh, official uh, co-production treaties to run their international office. And then after that was when the Quebec government came after me to um, open the, uh, the uh, first uh, Quebec Film Commission, as you mentioned, Marriott. So, so you know. So, in summary, I think the message is 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 it's worth compromising on uh, financial goals for something that's going to make you happy. And and you know, to to mirror what Michael said. I mean, I I, I never Michael and I never talked about this. So I thought it was very funny that we share the same life career philosophy. It's really great to hear this because in the previous, se previous sessions, and we often hear from leaders who say, follow your passion, that's all you have to do. But it's kind of hard to figure out what your passion is. It came to you later for both of you and you just followed along and made decisions when there were decision points. And I think it's always very important to remember that at any one moment, the full opportunity set of what you might do in life is not gonna be the same. Opportunities, it may open up that you could never have known about or you wouldn't have been prepared for them at the time and then there has to be a certain willingness to take risks i think uh, and as you say compromise on uh, uh, perhaps on financial outcomes so these are already really valuable specific examples of of what has been said in general by by previous leaders uh, alma i want to turn to you uh, obviously for you uh, working in coming to a major role in Abu Dhabi may not be as unusual as for someone who grew up somewhere else, but I'd love to hear more about your personal and professional journey to this major marketing and communications role. Uh, when did film and entertainment enter your, um, emerge as real possibilities and interests for you? Yeah, sure. So, um, so actually, uh, the, you know, the funny thing is that when I, I went to, to London and I studied arts and design. Um, and I was sure that that was the career path that I was going to take. So uh, I graduated as a graphic designer. And initially when I was going for interviews and looking for jobs, it was within that field. And I remember, um, you know, one day I had an interview with Image Nation and I thought, gosh, you know, media, that's that's not where, you know, I, I, I want to work. And you know, that's not the industry that I want to work in. Initially, that was my thought process. But I, you know, something intrigued me to go and 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 
go to the interview and and see what it's like. And then I remember leaving there um, with a completely different mindset. And I was, you know, very much interested in wanting to learn more about the media industry. And and um, it was an instinct that I took, which was, you know, okay, I was offered a job there, and and I I just accepted it. Um, and you know the role was for marketing, but you know within just a few months, uh, having you know worked there, I I quickly learned that you know I'm not really giving up my creativity because in order for you to work in the media industry, you, you have to be creative. Um, you know you're working with content, you're working with film, television, um, and and. and and I realized that it was uh, I was practicing, uh, you know, you know, my creativity, but in a different outlet, uh, you know, and platform. Um, and also, I, I just, you know, there's a message that I I want to I want to convey because I think sometimes, you know, I see that a lot of students or young adults they put tremendous pressure on themselves, um, thinking, you know, they have to have, you know, th their career plan. And, you know, if they studied, let's say business then, or economics, and that's, you know, they have, that's the area where they need to, um, you know, the industry that they need to fall into. But to be honest, you know, life is a journey and you have to, it it's okay to not know what, where you, you know, where your strengths are at the beginning. And it's only through, um, you know, being open to different experiences that you get to see where your strengths lie, um, you know, where your interests peak and, um, you know, what you like and what you don't like. And, and, and actually, if you study one major and then work in a different industry, then that's fine because the skill set that you learn is going to only enhance your role, uh, you know, in the, in the industry. So, so that's where I am. I think those are very wise words as well. Uh, obviously, creativity exists in all realms of human enterprise, not just in the arts. And in the media and entertainment uh, industry, which is so large, it's such a huge global industry, there are lots of ways to be productive in it, even if you're not making, not the director or the actor, there are after all very few people to whom those roles are given in the end. So. That's a very significant point. Something else I picked up from what you said, uh, actually, and maybe Hans as well, is that often it's other seeing something in you that helps you see it in yourself. Like you're offered this and you're like, why are they asking me to do this? I've had that experience more than once, especially when I was asked by the president of NYU at the time to begin to lead this, the building of this enterprise in 2007. Like, why? But you, you, someone has to say it to you and say what they see. And then you start exercising those muscles and you learn to do them. And I, I really hear you say that from that interview experience with the good people at Image Nation who saw that. Um, it's a powerful story. Let's talk about the industry because our students are also very interested in just broadly understanding what these industries are uh, about and what the trends in them are today. Everyone in Abu Dhabi and the UAE knows the name 2454. And everyone knows that it has a lot to do with media and creative industry here. But I bet that few of us really know just how extensive this company has become and what it encompasses. So I think maybe I'll go back to Michael first, but everyone can weigh in. Could you please describe for us the full scope of 2454 and also explain what a media free zone means okay uh let me begin by um saying that <clears throat> we are not really company, unlike uh, the two previous roundtables that uh that you had we're part of um the abu dhabi government and um we are in a, in a significant transition because our predecessors didn't really uh, understand what um, was an appropriate role for the government to play in our sector uh, and, uh, and try to do more, in our opinion, than, than had been uh, appropriate. And so, um, we are, this is an industry that is um, 
when you look anywhere uh, in, in the world, it's, it's driven by the private sector. It's not driven by uh, the government. What the government's role is as a, as a catalyst, as an enabler, when Hans, who can elaborate more on uh, this uh, on this role in Quebec and and now here, but it, it's not to be the industry. It, it's to create uh, the the conditions for the for the industry to to thrive. Now that said, we come from a region with a very rich and very long written and oral history uh, of storytelling but a very short history and no real professional experience in visual storytelling. And so uh, for a long time, uh, Image Nation and 2454 post the, the, the merger looked like a company because we had to do many of the things that this region was incapable of doing to demonstrate that it can be done. And you know we've now won two Academy Awards, the BAFTA Award, twelve Emmy Awards, and many other international awards. So we've demonstrated an ability to uh, deliver um, content to a, a global standard. So um, increasingly, and everything that we have done um, for our entire history, we've done with and through a private sector company in the hopes that the next time or the time after that, uh, they would uh, be able to do it on their own with, with, without us. Um, and I would also uh, say that, um, unfortunately, this is also a, a highly corrupt part of the world. And uh, corruption in the industry is something that we have dealt with, but I think it's worse here in this part of the world. So not only have we had to impose uh, creative standards, but we've had to develop mechanisms to uh, provide financial transparency and integrity as well. So with that uh, as, as sort of a background, um, we are really building the entire ecosystem and therefore uh, literally everything from what Bill does with his uh, at NYU with, with his performances and what uh, the, the Ministry of Culture and the Department of uh, Culture and the, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, we are an enabler. And so uh, literally from uh, public relations to, um, to press and information to um, uh, to, to content, to creation, to gaming and digital. Uh, we touch everything because in addition to building the ecosystem, we also are the regulator. We don't have the, the people who do that here. But so um, there, there's nothing media that doesn't uh, involve us. But at the end of the day, our job is to make other, that's why I tell people I have the most success, the most, the best job in the media industry because like Hans, I spent my whole life competing with other people. Now my job is to make everybody successful. And so, um, yes, the breath is really uh, all encompassing, but, um, but as I say, we're a catalyst and an enabler rather than you know, a, a company actually doing this. That's a very important distinction you've drawn there. And thank you for bringing out the difference between those private enterprise leaders we talked to before and this very unique sort of facilitator of private enterprise on behalf of the Abu Dhabi government. I will want to talk, ask Hans a little, and, and, and Alma a little bit more about the details of this, what kind of facilitation happens in their zone of work. But can you say something about uh, what uh, 2454 and still, and I guess Image Na Nation 2454 now, describe themselves also as a media free zone, which is part of that facilitation. Right. What right. does that mean? I get a lot of questions. Yeah. So, about that. so basically, there are many free zones here in Abu Dhabi and in, uh, in the world, really. And what a, a free zone is independent of the industry is either a physical or a, a virtual space where uh, the local laws do not apply. 
that that's why free zones were uh, created. They were either created in some places like Switzerland as tax havens. Uh, in other places, um, they were created in port areas that facilitated the transit of goods that could go without having to uh, technically enter the country. Um, and so um, in, in our part of the world, uh, where foreign direct investment is very important for our economic development, the, the value of these free zones is they allow companies to come to the region and operate under whatever law that the free zone agrees it will be regulated by. So you can be in Abu Dhabi and be regulated by uh, UK law, or you could be in Abu Dhabi and re be regulated by Dutch law. Um, uh, and there are other uh, uh, benefits of the free zone. So that is why uh, today we have multiple free zones and they're very industry uh, related because they need a certain amount of expertise to issue the licenses and provide the, the, the support. But also, you know, money laundering is a very big issue um, globally. And so if we're allowing all these companies to come and operate, we also have to make sure that they're operating legitimately and legally. And so, you know, we, we play an important uh, regulatory role, but I, I would say in five years, um, or certainly within 10 years, absolutely. I'm not sure free zones will exist in Abu Dhabi uh, because uh, Abu Dhabi is making this transition from a resource-based economy to a knowledge-based economy. And knowledge-based economies are very um, independent of location. And so uh, the, 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 the Abu Dhabi may become one big free zone over time. That's a beautiful vision. And uh, I would say, I agree with you, we're in this transformation that Emir Abu Dhabi is a part of it, becoming a knowledge-based economy here. Uh, I would also say that knowledge is probably the single greatest human knowledge and ingenuity are the single greatest renewable resource on the planet. So these, the, this is where our missions are quite aligned. Um, you know, uh, Hans, Alma, Hans, what would you say? What, what, what do you see the role of two, uh, Image Nation 2454 being? Um, well, you know, Michael said it very well. And so instead of, you know, re repeating what he said in, in different words, um, let me put my professor, my academia hat on. I used hey. to give a lot of master classes when I was in uh, Montreal and in Paris, too. Um, and That's I good always to know. Enjoyed... That's Sorry? Good to... Well, we'll keep an eye on that. That's great. Uh oh, oh <laughs> what did I get into? Oh, no, uh, it'd be my pleasure. Um, so, so, you know, when you're talking about um, a media ecosystem anywhere in the world, basically it consists of three components, creative, commercial, and industrial. Now in sophisticated ecosystems like London, Los Angeles, Vancouver, Montreal, Paris, um, the, the two first components, creative and commercial are private because as Michael said, uh, an economy flourishes with the private sector, not the public sector. The public sector is an enabler, is a trigger. The industrial component, though, always remain, always, is always triggered by the, the uh, public sector. So, so going back to the first component, what is creative? Creative is really three elements. It's content, financing, and distribution. And that's what Image Nation does. That's what Michael does. So the content is, is the, the, you know, the development, the stories, the, the, the writing, everything that's the creative aspect. Finance, you can't, and then once you have the content, you need to finance it to produce it. So, so it's the co-financing, um, you know, the, the third party financing, and then the distribution. There's no use creating and financing if it's not gonna be seen by anyone. And that's either broadcasting for TV or theatrical uh, for motion picture. So in a nutshell, that's the creative side. The commercial side is really everything that's, uh, that involves real estate, 
um, government services, and that's what 2454 does. So, so we have about 600 partners in the free zone hub known as 2454. Everything from production management companies to equipment vendors to 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 uh, content producers to to uh, just the whole gamut of sectors and subsectors in the industry. And then the third component, industrial, that's what a film commission takes care of. And basically you can also divide that into three subsectors. So the first is uh, infrastructure, the second is labor, and the third is hubs. And, and so let me start by the last one. Hubs is everything that's specialized like visual effects, dubbing, animation, uh, everything that's that's everything that 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 is is kind of exploiting the skill sets that already exist. The first one, infrastructure, is anything is anything that's really bricks and mortar needed to accomplish uh, what you're trying to accomplish, and that's sound stages, uh, you know, stuff uh, stuff like that. And then this this the third one, labor is all the people working. And so that's especially the technical skills, the, the uh, you know, everything from grips and lighting to set decoration and costumes and production accounting and production management and, and cinematography. All the, you know, there's about a hundred very well-defined uh, positions that are needed to create everything that Michael does on the creative side. And, and so, so basically, in, in a, in, that's the five minute uh, academia portrait of what a media, a media ecosystem is. This is a fantastically beautiful description. I was scribbling furiously, as I'm sure many of us were, very clear. And you can see that your own career took you from distributing creative content to the industrial side. Uh, in the film commission and that that now I understand what those hubs were about that you created in Quebec very interesting and it operates here to stick with you for that topic for a, a little bit longer you know I'm aware that quite a few cities have uh, film commissions and when I first heard of the title in New York I wonder why do they have a film commissioner can you can you tell us a little bit uh, what is in it for a city or a state to have a film commission? Why is that okay. so valuable? So, so, you know, just as there's three levels of government, there's also three levels of film commissions. So the three levels of the government are, as you know, federal, provincial or state, or here emirate, and then, and then uh, municipal, so cities. And it's the same with film commissions. You can have a national film commission, such as the the French Film Commission, the Hungary Film Commission. Then you can have uh, regional film commissions such as my, my uh, old film commission, the Quebec Film Commission, or the Georgia Film Commission, Georgia the state, not the country. <clears throat> and then you can have municipal film commissions. So what Pat Kaufman, when I was talking about New York, I was talking about New York City, that Pat Kaufman was in New York City. And then New York State also had a film and so the que your question is why? There's a lot of reasons why, but let me, let me keep it to three. The first is, is the business of um, service production. And service production is when you are helping somebody else make their film. So you mentioned in your introduction, I think you mentioned 300 and Smurfs, but we didn't produce it. I went to Sony for Smurfs or Legendary for 300. I said, come and spend your money in my jurisdiction and we'll do a great job for you. That's service production. And that industry that I just described, just, just, just described is an export industry. And that's why it's so interesting for any level of government because it's a fresh influx of capital. And that's what everyone's looking for. So, when Michael described the transition from resource-based to knowledge-based economy, it's because Abu Dhabi and the, the UAE are betting that there is going to be more potential influx of capital in decades to come to knowledge export than resource export. And so that's the first reason. The second reason 
and is related to the first reason, export, because not only is film, film production and export business, so is tourism. And that's the second reason is tourism. If a film or TV series, and now is streaming, is shot and identified and set in a location and successful, it can have a tremendous impact on tours, the tourism industry, which is also an export business. Just think of what um, Lord of the Rings did for New Zealand. Um, you know, no, nobody went to New Zealand before <laughs> Lord of the Rings. Now everybody goes when they have, you know, when they have time for to travel a day just to get there. And then, third and finally, I would say it's it's because of the high value job creation. Um, you know, one of the main economic indicators for any governmental uh, level is employment. Employment is a great indicator of the health of the economy. And, and the film and TV industry hires not only a lot of people, in Quebec it's about 35,000, but it's high value positions. And I'm not just talking about what we typically call above the line jobs, such as writing, directing, producing. I'm talking about below the line jobs, which I referred to before as technical positions. They're very high paid, they're very specialized. And then remember, I was talking about the hubs within the, in, the industrial trench, you know, visual effects, animation, those are also, gaming also, those are extremely specialized and high paying jobs. The economies love that because, uh, because people are earning more money, so therefore they're spending more money in the economy, but also it has a, it has a magnetic a factor where it, it's a bit of a brain drain. You're attracting specialized skills from overseas. That's exactly how we built the visual effects industry in Quebec is we put enough incentives and carrots in place to attract that knowledge and know-how and skill sets from overseas. And Wonderful. That, I hope that answers makes, your question. Oh, it makes a lot of sense. You can really see the value to municipalities and states Alma, very curious about your work at Image Nation 2454 in marketing and communications. How does that help facilitate uh, the creation and development of this creative ecosystem? Uh, so, so I started off in marketing uh, and communications, but my role has slightly is, has evolved um, into, you know, uh, working on specific projects that uh, that convey a public diplomacy uh, that help to support the UAE's public diplomacy vision. Um, so what that work and, you know, the reason we started the department was because, you know, we noticed that there was a, um, a gap in, um, you know, uh, in terms of raising, uh, how, you know, from, from when we deliver the content, you know, there is this, um, there was this big, uh, you know, need um, that was currently missing in, in Abu Dhabi where, you know, we were commissioned projects with um, a single minded message in mind, where, you know, there was usually, um, you know, a, a social um, action um, that was, that, that need, needed to be done. So when we started, you know, uh, the department, you know, we started taking on projects, whether that was, and, and there was an, uh, a single minded message, which was either to raise awareness or to educate audiences on important matters that would have otherwise been uh, overlooked. So, so through media, we were able to address these uh, topics to a, to a mass audience. Um, so, that, so that's how, you know, the role sort of developed um, and sorry, I lost my train of thought for a second. Okay. Could you repeat the yeah, you were, last? Yeah, I know you were talking about the development of the reasons, for, which I actually was very interested in asking you about, um, mm -hmm. how media interact with public diplomacy and cultural diplomacy and how the work that you do comes up behind what is a larger strategy for the Department of Culture and Tourism, but also for the government as a whole. So just anything you want to say about that, your work, how maybe we can make it a bit more specific, in fact, Alma. What about, I, I know that you, you work on these. Yeah, go ahead. Examples. So just, you know, just to uh, provide you 
again, with an overview. So what we do is we support, uh, you know, we strengthen government uh, relations as well as, you know, support the UAE's public diplomacy vision. And that's how, you know, we came to uh, partner with the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and International Art, uh, Cooperation. And, you know, we get, uh, you know, we, we start to work on projects for example, um, if I can give some examples, you know, we worked on a, uh, a recent project which was called History of the Emirates, and the overarching strategy was to reintroduce historical context uh, to the UAE, as well as, you know, is establish, um, you know, a, a, the UAE as a, as, as establish UAE within a global historical narrative. So that was a, a huge responsibility that that we had and the way we were able to um, you know educate audiences was through um, you know hosting uh, community led initiatives so we did screenings you know uh, where we were able to screen our content you know we went into schools we spoke to the students they were able to engage with his history content that you know, could be a bit heavy for, for young, uh, you know, young children age seven, you know, whether they're seven to 15 year olds, but we were, they were able to engage through interactive, uh, you know, inter interactive tools such as, you know, we had visual holograms, we had um, uh, an, an app, a mobile app. So, and then inter on an international front, we were able to do so by, you know, partnering with the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, hosting international screenings, you know, hosting webinar panels. Um, and that was, you know, that was the most effective way in which we were able to, uh, you know, um, raise international awareness as well as educate uh, a global audience. It's very interesting, the, the duality between on the one hand, educating internationally, but also about history back home, which is a mm -hmm. very interesting dual function. I know you were also very involved in the start of Quest Arabia. I've always mm -hmm. been fascinated. That's sort of a, a, a pan-Arab television station. How do you start a television station? What kind of capabilities does that take? Well, uh, I'll, start to, I'll start to answer yeah. that. Um, okay, sure. We, uh, uh, I, I'll be very candid. I'm, I'm always pretty, sometimes. Yeah, that's good. So I hope you all don't share this uh, too far outside no. this uh, group. This is but family. family. This is still uh, a somewhat chaotic uh, and, uh We are asked uh, by the leadership to do something for which we are not necessarily the most natural uh, pl place to get it done. But every time they've asked us to do something, it's far exceeded their expectations. And so, uh, you know, the old expression, no good deed goes unpunished. Our punishment is we're asked to do more and more, given more and more resources to do it with. And so uh, Sheikh Mohammed bin Zayed had a vision that um, if, I'm not sure you were here at the time, but you know, we have a big problem with uh, obesity and diabetes and lack of exercise. And, um, you know, one of the things I admire most about the leadership here is unlike um, leaders at m everywhere, not only in, in, in government, but in, in, in all levels of organizations, their style is generally do what I say, not what I do. And this is a leadership that says, do what I do. So um, this is when uh, the, the track at Yas Island was opened up Tuesday nights, but he didn't tell people to go there. He went there himself and he dragged the whole leadership with him and, 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 and led by example. And we were asked to document that. And from that point on, basically, when he wanted to communicate something, whether we were the natural place to turn, he did. So we knew a year before uh, national service that this was coming. And um, he wanted us to help prepare the nation for this, not only the kids who were about to go in, but their families and, and, and everyone else. 
and um, and we began uh, our proposal began with a research uh, project, budget for a research project, and um, and then a budget for um, you know a, a film a television series. And unfortunately, you know, we still, although I think we're getting much better at it in the country, have a bit of a ready fire aim mentality that when the ship says something, people go off and running before in sort of double checking to make sure that they're heading in the right direction. So we, you know, started to prepare for this uh, research project that was uh, measuring public attitudes towards the armed forces. And we were told, no, you know, these are our people. We know exactly what they think. You know, Sheikh Mohammed wants this, so let's get going. I said, no, this proposal has first the research and then, no, we don't need that. We're ready to go forward. And well, you know, he's giving us 10 million uh, a dirham and to move the dial. Don't you think he wants to know where the dial is to see whether it moved? So finally they sort of gave up and knew that we were gonna do this research project first. And it was a very useful exercise because we learned two things. We learned that um, unfortunately, like most people around the world, uh, large numbers of people think about the military as a place I used this before um, Donald Trump was around, but it was um, um, it was a place for losers who couldn't get a job anywhere else. But there was quite an interesting number of people here <coughs> who felt um, that they weren't good enough for the military. And um, this informed us and led us to understand that we um, uh, could develop a series that we call in English, My Military, My Life, which basically uh, showed people that you, you didn't have to be a special weapons, special uh, forces soldier or Apache helicopter pilot. You could be a mechanic, a teacher, a cook, a nurse, a doctor, do many things in the, in the military. And it really humanized uh, the military and prepared people for um, the announcement of national service. It was quite successful. And similarly with the Quest Arabia, there are a lot of um, outdoor activities that are uh, unique to our region, whether it's falcon hunting or uh, in many other uh, uh, activities or um, similar activities that are done here that people may not know about it, whether it's rock climbing or scuba diving or so, you know, as part of this view of getting people to uh, to, to live a, a, a more outdoor life, to uh, participate actively, to uh, also spread the culture of what we do uh, around the world, um, His Highness wanted to do quest wanted to do a, uh, a a channel, and basically he came to us. Um, and said, uh, how do we do it? And we spent a year um, exploring opportunities, gave a wide range of uh, opportunities that uh, we felt uh, made no sense, but we wanted to put on the table. We ended up with, with Quest Arabia and basically uh, it was quite successful, but we ended it mainly because um, there was we, we had come to the conclusion that for a lot of reasons, even before the, the crash of oil prices and other uh, problems, that this was never going to be a profitable channel and uh, that it really made no sense for the government to continue to subsidize it. So after several years, despite its rating success and high level of satisfaction with the audience, and pleasure with the, by, you know, the, the, the satisfaction leadership, we, we, we finally shut it down. Yeah. But it's how we ended up doing the history series. We're working on a major uh, feature film that will be launched. Um, so 
you know, we, we just tend to be the place that the leadership comes when they've got a problem and they know it's going to be solved, you know, impeccably. That's a great well, thank question. you. Thank you for that. I, I was interested in the story of Krasarvia, and I think it's an important, it's important, I think, to say that in any enterprise you are in, some things will not quite work out. Some things will outright fail. Others, the timing will be right for them. And knowing when to cut your losses is important. And I think yeah. you just exemplified that beautifully. Um, we're having a lot of questions from students coming in. As you can see, uh, audience, uh, this is an incredibly knowledgeable and open-hearted and open-minded panel. So keep them coming. I'm gonna go to some of these questions. One uh, is we've talked a lot about companies and enterprises and so forth. A whole other important aspect of the creative ecosystem, so critical to places like New York or Los Angeles or London, is the freelance community. And 2454's freelance community, the way you are supporting it, marks really a key shift in expanding the market for uh, creative talent, where creative talent can go. Can you tell us uh, more, any of you really, about what it takes to thrive as a freelancer in Abu Dhabi? Uh, many of our students are visual artists, designers, uh, theater artists, super talented students who certainly would like to keep doing this job of making interesting work, but also are of course worried about financial uh, security. Uh, any of you may speak to this. Well, I, I'll start and then start. turn it over. Yep. <clears throat> we are rapidly approaching in uh, the film and television and um, I would say uh, the, the uh, well, let me start with film and television. Um, a, a stage where young graduates can uh, enter the field and hope, to, if they're successful, to uh, earn uh, the same as or more than their um, uh, peers who enter the government or go, go into other fields. Mm. Um, that said, um, this is a very Darwinian industry, so that uh, the, 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 it's the survival of the fittest. So uh, people have to understand the need to prove themselves. But when you see, you know, the go to a Hollywood fit film and there's no reason, you know, to sit to past the end of the movie, but if you do and watch that very long credit call, and so you see that maybe three or 400 names on there, uh, number one, you realize how many jobs are involved. <clears throat> but the one thing I would say, uh, although obviously I don't know the names of many of those people there, one thing I can say with almost complete certainty <clears throat> is that there's no name on that credit crawl that doesn't know at least one other person on that um, list and has vouched for them. So this is a business, uh, an industry of starting at the bottom, proving yourself, building your personal professional network, and then relying not only on your talent, but on uh, the recommendations and your reputation. Um, I would say that in the uh, support areas like uh, marketing and uh, communication and public relations, and all the um, advertising, um, you know, um, there is already the ability to earn um, a, a steady and a reliable uh, income. Um, the area that is uh, the most challenging, but I think it's challenging everywhere in the world, is people who uh, see themselves as artists whether they're writers, painters, um, because that's uh, unfortunately the nature of that, um, that, 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 that field. But the people that are going into um, professional uh, areas, um, I, I think we're close to the point and, and because the people on this webinar and in the school are young enough that I think you could 
sort of enter the field with a, a certain degree of confidence. I'll just quickly end by saying my son, who's an incredibly talented uh, artist, spent 10 years until he realized he, despite his talent, was never going to succeed financially. And over those 10 years, uh, uh, made the transition from being an oil painter to a graphic designer. And now he's, you know, making over $300,000 a year as one of the most sought after freelance graphic designers. So, you know, and you say that number again, you, you, you cut out with the number and I'm sure that will be interesting to you as a graphic designer. 300,000 US dollars a year. Nice, nice. So, uh, I, you know, I wouldn't discourage people, especially at a young age, from um, how difficult uh, their dreams may be to achieve. Because as Hans was telling his story, as I've told my story, you know, I don't think there is wasted uh, time if you turn um, uh, your experience into life lessons and you learn from them and grow from them. And so, you know, I try to tell parents that uh, if you think about all the people that you don't like, you, uh, they all may be very different, but they all have generally have one thing in self uh, in common, which is low self-esteem. So don't worry about your kid being toilet trained. Don't worry about your kid walking. Don't worry about your kid reading. Like, all those things are going to happen, but that anxiety is unconsciously communicated to kids, which is why firstborn are always, I don't know what the composition in your school is, but in your university, but firstborns are always the overachievers because they're always thinking they're failing their parents. And so they're always trying to compensate for that anxiety, which parents don't even understand they're communicating. But, you know, I tell them that, you know, you have to let go of the hand and kids are going to fall down before they learn to walk. You got to let go to the back of the bicycle for them to learn to ride. But it's the same thing for your graduates. You know, you got to be willing to fall down uh, to walk and you got to walk before you run. But all these things are valuable experiences that, you know, you should uh, welcome, not fear. This is an extremely welcome long-term perspective, especially in a time of great uncertainty for early career outcomes. That said, I would love to hear a little bit from Hans and Alma maybe about this question in the immediate run. Of course, this uh, creative and media ecosystem that you're so important in contributing to, that you're helping build, what would you see or what would you say are the kinds of skills and attitudes and abilities that may be most needed, that where maybe, of course, the talent is everything, right? And where are there areas where uh, you imagine the country would benefit from having more of it to be developed or to come uh, onto the market? Just this is a shorter term question, really. So if I, uh, if I may start, uh, Hans, um, I, <laughs> I thank you. I think that, you know, um, a lot of people want to become filmmakers without knowing what that job entails. And I think that also, you know, you know, their, their perception is, you know, if they want to enter the media industry or the filming industry, then they have to either be producers or directors. But actually, you know, what we really need is, you know, we need talented production set de designers, you know, people that are working on production. Um, you know, we need script writers. We need, there are a lot of other jobs that 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 are that we, that are required and that are currently missing um, that we need to fill and and you know you you can still enter filmmaking without you know having to be without being a director or producer so you know we definitely more uh, we definitely need more people that are in the um, you know production operational side of filming um, you know whether that's production managers set designers um, you know. Uh, in terms of a production setup, those are sort of the jobs that are that are currently missing. And I think also that another thing that I find is that, uh, especially with with you know young uh, you know aspiring filmmakers, 
you know, sometimes there's a resistance. So, so us as 244 and Image Nation, you know, we provide training, we provide, um, you know, through the, we have multiple, so we have our film studio, which provides training and development, um, and we offer opportunities for, uh, you know, aspiring filmmakers to get their films produced and to get them out there and to be seen in international festivals. But I think that sometimes, um, you know, what I see is that these students sometimes get uh, discouraged because they feel that, you know, we're trying to, to control, uh, to, to have, you know, add, to control their, their creative process or, you know, to kind of dictate, you know, what the content should be about. But actually all, all that we are doing is, you know, uh, mentoring them to be, you know, to be the best that they can be. And I think that people need to be a bit more open to, to that critique because we, you know, we do have uh, industry experience. And I think that it's okay to, to make mistakes and it's okay to, you know, to have other people mentor you and, and, and ask, you know, to help enhance your work. And that doesn't mean that you're losing your creative process. Great. Any comments from Hans? You want to come in on that? Of course. Always comments, Marriott. <laughs> um, no, listen, um, you know, Michael and Alma painted it really clearly. Um, uh, you know, I, I, I might just add that, you know, what I've noticed throughout my career, and it's not only true in the UAE, it's true in America, it's true in so many places, <clears throat> is you know, so many people want to be a star. They want to be a celebrity, you know, and if they can't make it as a singer on America's Got Talent, they want to be a film director or a producer because producer sounds good. But I will tell you two things. One is I, I don't know many producers that make more money than production accountants. I don't know many directors that make more money than film editors. Right? And the happiest people are the guys doing the, and, lay, and, and the, the people doing the technical jobs because it's stressful, but it's, they, it's nothing like directors and producers who never know where their next gigs are gonna come from. They're only as good as their last success. And, and you know, 99% of this industry is freelancers. And that's how we began this question, Mary, you were asking mm -hmm. about freelancers, 99% of the, the talent, the, 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 the labor pool is freelancers. But, you know, there's certain freelance uh, jobs that are much riskier than others. And uh, I'll just finish with a story. I, I remember when a few years ago, I was having a lunch with Mike Medavoy. Mike Medavoy was the chairman of Columbia TriStar. He's produced over 300 films. He won eight Oscars. And I remember him telling me he started in this industry by making coffee. He was in some, some trailer, and I can't remember what lot it was, making coffee. And so I said, so after that, what, you became a producer? He said, no, after that, I was the photocopy boy. Okay, so after that, you were a producer. No, after that, I was the mail boy. I was in the mail room. Took him 20 years to get up to where he did yeah, and this and goes so, back to what this goes back to what I was saying about being a Darwinian industry. Yeah, Darwin. Because when when you think about what we do, we create something out of nothing. And so, uh, and as as Hans said, this is a very glamorous industry from the outside, but it is. Oh, sorry, my. Um, I, I, so my, we can hear you clearly. Okay, okay. there you go. So uh, this is a very glamorous uh, industry from the outside, but um, uh, as hopefully people on this webinar uh, uh, understand, it, it's a lot of hard work and it's 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 a lot of detail. Yeah. And so I um, am happy, and I extend that invitation, by the way, to everybody on this uh, webinar. Uh, my my, I put my uh, email address in the, the chat. Everybody is free to contact me. I answer my own phone. I meet with everybody. But when people uh, call me, I'm giving you a little <laughs> inside tip here. I may not do this to you guys, but you know, I could be playing Sudoku, doing the uh, crossword puzzle. Uh, but when I get a call, I say yeah, for, from somebody that I know is calling 
because they're uh, just starting out. This is not for people, you know, further down the road who have a CV. I say, oh yeah, I'd love to meet with you, but I'm bit, I'm in a meeting right now. That's why I said I could be playing Sudoku or doing something else. But could you give me a call next Tuesday at, at, at two o'clock? And they call me at two, and then uh, I say, well, could you call me, you know, at uh, 11 o'clock on Thursday. And then 11 on Thursday, they call the third time I go see them. Because just like uh, um, um, I'm to story, Mike Medavoy, if you can't advocate for yourself and do all these hard jobs, uh, you're never going to do the, the, the more important jobs. And so uh, this is a you know, uh, that expression, it's not a dash, it's a marathon. Th this, a career in our industry as a freelancer is a marathon. And you have to be prepared and, and happy working at the bottom and not think, get, you know, I still get coffee from people when they come see me. So you can't think that's below your dignity. You have I'll to- vouch for, I'll vouch for that. <laughs> so, um, you know, if you want to be a successful freelancer in our business, it's a long-term commitment, and it's a definitely bottoms-up career if you're going to be successful. Great advice. Um, and Maria, you were, yep. in your question also, I'm not sure we answered it. You, you were asking what the students need, and I think you were What are the about, attitudes that are missing in the UAE? The, people are very interested in this labor market here. So are there, if you have you done a gap analysis as a new film commissioner, for example, of what you would like, what kind of attitudes, skills, habits of mind um, are missing? Yeah. Or is there and, a lot of room for? And I think you've all begun to answer it, but if you want to go at it that way, that would be great. Well, I was just, because I was reading the, the Q&A and Mauricio Yanez asked, what are the two values that you have internalized throughout your career that you would love to see reflected in the up and coming generations? You know, I'm old enough to have noticed, uh, you know, a com you know, a trend, a, co a common denominator. I would say there's four attributes and I can expand on them if anyone wants it. It's patience, curiosity, tolerance, and resilience. If you and have those four add, attributes- And to that, I would add humility. Humility. Yeah. Saying, can you say them one more time? Can you say all five of them one more time, loud and clear, uh, Hans? Sure. So patience, curiosity, tolerance, resilience, and humility. Beautiful. I think those are words to live by. And so again, notice students that they deliberately there's there you will not get an answer from really seasoned thinkers in this industry that will say well we need more people to hold the sound boom or something like that they're looking for attitudes smarts curiosity willingness to work patience and so forth here's a quite specific question that i'd like to direct to, to alma it comes from amna uh, and Amna says in the UAE, there isn't much representation or a foundation for English creative writing, but there is a significant amount in Arabic. What advice would you give to an aspiring Emirati writer who just wants to share the Emirati story, presumably in English, but what, how can people, is there a way to, for them to really be develop these skills or, or find ways to deploy that talent. This sounds like someone you might want to talk to. <laughs> you know what I was just going to say? Um, I actually find uh, it to be the opposite. It is very difficult to find really good Arab, uh, Arabic content. Um, but I would say, you know, in terms of creative writing, there are many um, platforms available to help um, harness your skills, you know, whether if, if you're interested in, in, for example, script writing, then, you know, like I mentioned, you know, we do have a program that helps um, 
helps you develop your script writing skills. I know that, you know, CNN does a, Academy does a fantastic program um, to help harness your skills. There are many online outlets as well available. So, you know, it's just about, and I'm not sure when, you know, it, it's quite vague. So I'm not sure in terms of creative writing, is it journalism or is it um, film script writing? I, I'm not sure, uh, you know, what, what Amna uh, was referring to exactly. But I think that there are many supportive outlets that can help harness your skills. Thank you for that. Um, I see, Michael, you're going to get lots of emails. And we will distribute that email address. Don't worry. The chat is sort of disabled, I think. But we, we, we will distribute it. I have a question here from Reem on another topic. And that is, what is your take on how museums and art galleries today are embraced within the media and communication sector? Are there any initiatives or collaborations? For Alma. Okay. Closely we, with a lot of the, yeah. uh, Please tell us. Sorry, right. can you, uh, I, it's yeah. could you? Uh, I'll, I'll, repeat. I'll repeat the question. The question mm -hmm. from Reem was, uh, how do media and communications, how does that sector embrace or work with, in specific ways with the, uh, the burgeoning museums and art gallery uh, sector. So, yeah, so, so um, you, know, our, you know, in the past few years, we have become uh, very much involved with the museums. We work with uh, the Department of Culture and Tourism. You know, we're working closely with the Louvre Abu Dhabi Museum, as well as, um, you know, the soon to open uh, Zayed National Museum. And I think also, um, you know, museums are realizing that, uh, you know, the, you know, there's there's sort of a cross, um, there's a merge between, you know, mu museums want their out uh, their content to be out there, and I think they're 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 venturing uh, out, you know, more venturing from the traditional route. So it's not just about having pretty, you know, paintings in the museums, but what they're doing is, you know, they're they're, they're getting their content out there by having, for example, virtual tours, or for example, you know, um, you know, we work a lot with museums to produce short content that can be screened in, uh, you know, in museums, but also to bring those artifacts to life through, uh, you know, mainstream media. So, so I think that there are many ways which which media and and art museums are there's a cross section right now and and they're working uh, more cohesively together so whether it's creating content for museums whether it's you know um you know working on apps or platforms virtual exhibitions um there's a lot that we're doing with museums in that space to kind of bring those artifacts and and paintings to life I can well imagine, indeed, this becoming Sorry, a big. For me to add, uh, you know, I, I'm going back to history of the Emirates because we did work with museums on this specific project, and an example of this, you know, you know, in the documentary, we featured uh, uh, the oldest pearl in the UAE. Now that was part of Louvre's uh, exhibition uh, piece. So what we ended up doing is we ended up, you know you know, we featured the pearl in the documentary, we went to the museum, we created talks, we created panels, you know, we did, um, you know, we worked on a hologram display, a visual hologram display to bring those artifacts, you know, when we wanted to go visit uh, public spaces, you know, it's not possible to, to take these artifacts from the museum, so we recreated it in a, in a visual uh, hologram display, um, so, so these are just examples of, of of how you know we've been working together in that space. Wonderful. This is an opportunity to uh, underscore that point and say, of course, the Sheikh Zayed National Museum is likely to require a lot of media help of this kind. And also to yeah. let all of you know, if you didn't already, that next week from the 16th to the 18th, we will have an extremely exciting symposium on the future of museums, the digital and the physical, during pandemic, post-pandemic, uh, co-organized by NYU Abu Dhabi and the Louvre Abu Dhabi. It will be very lively. Um, our registration is almost full at 1000, but that doesn't really matter because everyone can participate because it will also be on YouTube, almost instant uploading on YouTube of all the sessions. So you're very much encouraged if you're interested in creative industries. This is a very great sort of space where museum leaders and thinkers and media folks and 
people from the gaming industry from around the world will be talking together. It will be, and including many locals, of course. So, so join us. A um, couple more quick questions. Maybe they're big questions. Christian wants to know, uh, how big of a role do tax rebates play in attracting productions? What is that kind of strategy like? Can that be improved uh, in Abu Dhabi, you think? Uh, maybe this is a question for Hans. Yeah, um, you know, look, look the, the reason why Abu Dhabi is, the, the, there's many reasons, but the main reason why Abu Dhabi is creating a film and television industry in Dubai is not. They're, they're creating a very good commercial industry, but not film and television, is, is to start with the tax credits or what we call, you know, incentives. Um, you know, it's becoming more and more difficult to produce, to finance productions, whether it's film, TV, episodic, drama, documentary. And so, so you know, rebates play an, an increasingly important component of the production financing strategy. And so therefore, increasingly, producers from everywhere, Hollywood, Bollywood, independence, Europe, Arab, Arabic, they're looking at jurisdictions where there's a competitive rebate in place. And then it's become even more important today since COVID because, you know, because of the pandemic, production budgets have now increased from 10 to 30% because of all sorts of health and security measures they have to put into place now. Um, COVID specialists, uh, testing, uh, testing protocols. And, and then the last one is insurance, completion bonding is a much more expensive today if they can even get it. Mm -hmm. And so, so jurisdictions with rebates have become more important than ever. So, so to, um, to, to that Christian's question, Christian was it I think to his question, yeah, rebates are, are key. If you, if you don't have a, a rebate program and competitive one at that, forget it. Everything else is, is gonna be <clears throat> chasing, after, chasing after business that'll never come. Thank you, that's, that's very clear. There are quite a few questions, as you can imagine, about uh, COVID-19. We don't know when the end of it will come. It will at some point, is what I keep saying, but it certainly is a challenge and a slog. Uh, so we try to do everything we can to enhance community. I have one quick and one broader question on it. The first is from someone in the, in the, in the Q&A. Is, is ImageNation 2454 taking remote interns this year? And if so, what are some of the areas you're interested in? Uh, the answer is yes. Good. And uh, the second answer very easily is every area. We love interns. Uh, um, they're unpaid. Uh, again, this goes back to my Darwinian view. If you're not willing to, you know, learn and, and invest in yourself, we're not really that interested in investing in you. Uh, and therefore, um, we rarely turn down people who um, want internships. And we have them across the board uh, from uh, our current productions through um, marketing, communication, graphic design. Really, if you, for those who are asking the graphic design question, graphic design internships probably, you should be the most aggressive in pursuing those because <clears throat> I was trying to say earlier how important these personal professional networks are. And if you work with Lama and you know, the, the team and you are recognized for your talent, uh, she will lead you to other opportunities. and maybe even offer opportunities uh, with us directly. It's great that you're open to remote internships. We've tried to help our students really find those wherever possible. Donna does an amazing job with her team. Of course, we, as you can imagine, we advocate for paid internships, even if they're not highly paid because it's an equity consideration for us. Some of our students I, I, really I need- I understand, but I, this, I have, as you can tell, I have certain strong views. Yes. Uh, and uh, this is one of them. I, I do not believe in, uh, in paid internships, um, especially for students. Well, we, it, it's true that we also support our students in many other ways. So there are often ways to, to find 
find that opportunity and create it in a good context that the student can pursue it, even if they may not have, may, may right. really need to work in some ways. I, I so, know I'm talking a lot, yeah. but I, I'm going to tell one other uh, story. Okay, about okay tell me one other story. Ben is now the chief um, content officer and the COO of the Combined Image Nation uh, 2454. He's been here six years. I knew his father who came to see me um, 20 plus years ago and said, uh, uh, my son has this crazy idea and wants to go into the film business. I want you to meet with him when he's home on scrim spring vacation and talk him out of it. I'm happy to pay for him to go to um, a law school, a business school, but uh, I, my wife and I just do not want to see him going in film and television business. So I met with Ben um, and then uh, I met again with uh, his father and I said, Stu, listen, number one, it's Ben's life, not your life. Number two, he's passionate about this. I think he, you know, could have a great career. And if he is interested and willing, I'll get him uh, the first job. So it's not what uh, Stu wanted to hear, but he allowed it. Two years went by. Ben came to see me when I was back home and he said, look, I can't live. Uh, you know, I'm basically working for nothing. Assistants, as, um, as Hans described, make coffee and then they sit on the desk and they listen in and put calls and then really learn from the bottom. Up. I said, okay, let me talk to your dad. So I talked to Stu again and I said, look, Stu, you're still willing to pay for Ben's business school or law school room board tuition. Why don't you just give him the money that you're willing to give and make a deal with him that if it runs out, he's got to come back. So again, he didn't really want to, he was a reluctant, but he did. And of course the money never ran out. So uh, I, I, that story sort of illustrates that, you know, that is the way of Hollywood and that is the way of our industry. And we honestly don't want people who aren't willing to show that they're ready to sacrifice to be successful. Because as I said earlier, this industry looks too glamorous from the outside. Mm -hmm. And we want to keep out all the people who can't make that commitment. And if they're too poor, uh, well, they're not too poor if they're going to, uh, you know, NYU Abu Dhabi. There are ways that they can, uh, can they have spare time. But if they're too poor, you know, we, we might look for ways to subsidize them, but th they would be the rare exception. Mm -hmm. uh this has been a fantastic conversation. I'm going to ask each of you just one sentence. Um, what gives you hope for the future? Because we all need that and think about that a lot. Since I'm going to give you a second to think about it, what gives you hope for the future that you can say to our students? It will be fantastic to hear that. I really want to thank all three of you for being so candid and open uh, about uh, the challenges of building a new creative, vibrant creative industry, and also congratulate you on already the enormous accomplishments that you've had in this regard. What gives you hope for the future, Hans? Um, uh, oh, wow, so, so many things. I mean, you know, I, I remember my father used to always complain about the future, the world is a terrible place. And my view was, we always used to fight about this because I was of the absolute opposite opinion. I think the world is going in a better place. I think the younger minds are getting sharper. They're more aware. Um, somebody in this call, at, at Alma was talking about the pressure youngsters have and you know deciding what they're gonna do earlier on. I didn't have that at, at back then. And you know, I just think that, um, I just think there's so much and you look at the, the self-generated content now that's being produced um, and that's being shown on YouTube and TikTok and, and other platforms. And, you know, not, not just the creative elements, the dancers and the singers and the actors, but the technical elements to get all that, to make all that stuff together and for nothing, you know. Um, so I just think the industry is in the, the future of the industry is in a really good place because we have a lot of talent, a lot of smart people. Um, 
in UAE and Abu Dhabi, especially, we're extraordinarily fortunate to have a government and a leadership that gets it. They get the benefits of a, 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 a burgeoning and flourishing film and television production industry, from the economic benefits to the tourism benefits, to the creative benefits, to the awareness benefits, to the job creation. And so, you know, I could go on, but to answer your question, Marriott, I think we're in a very good place and the future looks rosy. That's good to hear. Uh, uh, Alma, what do you think? Um, Hans, you stole my answer. I was going to say pretty much uh, the same thing, but I think that, you know, as, as Hans mentioned, there's a lot of tools, you know, the technical the technological advancements and the tools that are available to us today. And I can only imagine what, what's going to be available for us in 10 years time is just immense. And I think that it's created a lot of opportunities. I think our leadership have instilled, you know, a lot of support, especially with the youth in terms of pursuing, you know, following their passion, pursuing their goals, diversifying in terms of, you know, you know, their, their job opportunities. I mean, when my, you know, my parents, when my parents were, were my age or a bit younger, you know, everyone was either in finance or in, you know, there were very limited, um, I think, fields that people used to work in. And I think now people are realizing that it's okay to branch out. And actually there's, you know, there, there are a lot of opportunities available. And I also want to say that I, I feel that, um, you know, the younger generation um, are a lot more confident in themselves, um, as opposed to you know, you know the youth in like forty years back. I think that there are, there's a lot of self awareness, and I think that people are much more confident um, to to pursue their 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 goals and, and passions mm -hmm. in a truly meaningful way. Thank you for that. I quite agree. Michael, we'll end with you. What gives you hope? Well, I uh, must say uh, I am not very hopeful for the world. Um, I think that um, we have a lot of problems with uh, third and fourth rate uh, leaders that are in Cape and political systems that uh, render us uh, almost incapable of addressing them. Uh, that said, um, I think uh, Abu Dhabi in the UAE remains an island of hope and not the only, but a rare, Norway would be the, only, the second country I would include in that bucket of hopeful places. And I think, um, you know, as Alma just said, uh, the, the, the leadership, which is, is in its second generation, but I've uh, Alma and I and Hans have been lucky to get to know the third generation. And I think that, um, you know, one of the things that I've seen here is that when I arrived 14 years ago, you had um, your chairman, um, um, uh, the um, uh, Ahmed Al Saya, um, and, and one or two, oh, and uh, Sultan Al, Al Jaber. And, uh, and uh, along with Khaldun and, you know, I used to call it the Abu Dhabi disease where they find these people who had great, incredible talent and ability and then overwhelm them with responsibilities, which shockingly, they never diluted their ability to deliver. I was always expecting that to occur. But now we have under uh, Khaldun you know, another generation under them, another, and, and then we have uh, Alma's uh, generation and uh, the students, uh, you know, below that. And we now have this uh, critical mass of, of talent that is, extends far beyond uh, the, the, the leadership, the political leadership, in whom they have confidence and are willing now, we see this dispersion of authority which is, uh, we talked about the transition, the economic transition. There's also a governance transition that, uh, that authority is becoming more distributed. There's certain aspects obviously held very closely, but if we, if we look at the sectors that uh, you know, affect our daily lives, we see 
a, a dispersion and distribution of, of power and authority. So I don't, I don't want to go in why I'm so gloomy about the rest of the world, but I will end on a very high note that, you know, my, my regret is, is not really to see the success of Abu Dhabi, because to me that is given. There's one other thing that we haven't really uh, talked about, and it's a, obviously a, a subject for another day, but that, that's the empowerment of women. The women are taking over Abu Dhabi. And, you know, you and I have kind of seen this in the 80s elsewhere, but it, it's happening here, uh, you know, in warp speed. And my big regret is I'm not going to live long enough to see the full impact of, of this because I think it will be the most profound and most important change, that, change that's going to take place in the, the next 10 to 20 years in, here in Abu Dhabi. Here, here. I do think this has been is becoming an incredible place for women, women in leadership positions and bringing along the whole knowledge economy. So that is indeed a very hopeful thought. I would extend it sort of along the lines of Hans and Alma to also say, while that is all indeed really good here, we know that Abu Dhabi and the UAE don't want to be a bubble by themselves. And I think the international solidarity that they represent is also something that really motivates our students. And so our students, while 40% of them stay here after graduation, the other 60% are scattered around the world bringing the, the things that they have learned here in our university and in the country. So that gives me hope too. I don't think all is lost, even though I am hardly naive. We are not naive about some of the dark clouds that we see over uh, the planet's environment, of course, and these, these uh, kind of political divisiveness to which you alluded, uh, Michael. This has become a very rich philosophical seminar uh, from beginning to end, along with lots of practical and applicable insights. I want to thank our wonderful panel, Michael, Alma, Alma and Hans for your fantastic insights and contribution. I think you're gonna hear a lot from our students. Uh, and, well, they're uh, more than welcome to. I invite welcome. all of you to feel free to get Great. in touch. We look forward to seeing what Image Nation 2454 will do next. Thank you all so much and see you at the next roundtable, all of you in the audience. Bye-bye. Okay. Bye-bye.